<clears throat> Today's scripture readings are both translations from the Common English Bible. The first reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 6, verses 45 to 52. Right then, Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake, toward Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After saying goodbye to them, Jesus went up unto a mountain to pray. Evening came and the boat was in the middle of the lake, but he was alone on the land. He saw his disciples struggling. They were trying to row forward, but the wind was blowing against them. Very early in the morning, he came to them, walking on the lake. He intended to pass by them. When they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost and they screamed. Seeing him was terrifying to all of them. Just then he spoke to them, be encouraged. It's me, don't be afraid. He got into the boat and the wind settled down. His disciples were so baffled they were besides themselves. That's because they hadn't understood about the loaves. Their minds had been closed so that they resisted God's ways. The second reading is from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 17 to 23. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me, for I haven't yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them, I'm going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. Then she told them what he said to her. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish, Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they, won't, they aren't forgiven. Let the church hear what the Spirit is telling us today. Hymn number 629, Stand By Me. Thank you. 
that, that, that hymn is a favorite of mine, and every time I sing, sing it or hear it sung, I think of this woman in the congregation I served in Connecticut. You know, people sit in the same places basically every Sunday, right? And so Lou Emily was the oldest person in the congregation, and she sat in the back corner over there. And we were singing this, this hymn, and I had put in the hymn in the bulletin verses 1 through 3 because the organist's spouse had said to me, Judy, three verses of any hymn is enough. <laughs> and <laughs> so at the end of our third verse, Lou Emily, said, Lou Emily said, because in a small church, people just speak out. Lou Emily said, why aren't we singing that first fourth verse? That means something to me. So the organist started playing again, and we sang, when I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. You gotta love people. Oh, you do love people, right? That's why you're here. Let's pray. A holy God, we come to this place, this time of worship, to hear what it is that the Spirit would say to us, that we can take into our spirits, into our lives, to help us live faithful lives as your disciples. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you. O Lord, you are our rock, our redeemer, the person who comes to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, storms of life. We would not be the first disciples to experience storms and fears. Our two gospel lessons this morning, one is part of the lectionary, but the other one, which you may have surprised you to hear a post-Easter story in July, uh, also deals with fears of the disciples. For some time now, I'm not sure exactly how long it's been, but at least a year, maybe even longer, I've been thinking a lot about fears, maybe because I have a lot of fears. So when the pastor of the Harwich United Methodist Church, where I attend during the summers when I'm here, emailed and said, would I like to supply preach while she was on vacation? I said, yes. Not so much because I was looking for work to do so quickly after I returned to the Cape, but because I needed to hear a sermon about fear. <laughs> and so I, you know, I said, yes. I needed to do some serious reflecting about the subject because I needed some spiritual help with my fears. I compiled my own list of fears, my aging, my spouse's aging, climate change, our fragile democracy, that was a big one, and a few others. But I didn't want to go just on the basis of my own fears. I wanted to find out were my fears what other people were fearing. And so I contacted, I contacted the Bible study group here. I contacted another group, two other groups down in Maryland where I live and where I worship to find out what was their fears. And so what I learned was my list was going longer, but there was a lot of congruence with, with what I had suggested. One person said all of the above. But then were added these others, some of which surprised me from an older person, the fear of failure and not meeting people's expectations. Another was about the safe, safety and welfare of loved ones. Some had concerns about their economic security. An African-American woman mentioned fears about losing voting rights, threats to black lives from racial profiling and inequities in health care. And one woman, this was maybe the most surprising because she had several, several serious health concerns, but great faith, said her one fear was snakes. <laughs> Legitimate, you know? And from my own troubled waters of my denomination, the not very United Methodist Church, was the fear of can our denomination survive? as it faces a major decision in 2022. And today, listening to the news, I think I would add fears that this pandemic is going to last a very, very long time. So now, have I said anything that you resonate with? 
I think. So, you know, that wasn't the end of my research, though. I had to go online, and this is one of the things I found out. Did you know that October 12th, 2021, is International Face Your Fears Day? <laughs> we must have a lot of fears to have a day for it. It was founded 14 years ago by, maybe not surprisingly, a public speaker. I wondered if the Bible was mentioned in my online list of resources. No. So I decided I'd Google further and went to quotes about fears. Maybe the Bible would have a quote. So the first article that came up was 17 inspiring quotes to help you face your fears. Under that it said, Anxiety can stop you in your tracks and hold you back. It is not easy to face your fears and push through them, but it's essential. I thought that was good advice. But to my amazement, there was not one quote in those 17 from the Bible, although there was one from Marilyn Monroe. The quote I liked best came from Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist. He said this, fear can keep us focused on the past or worried about the future. Yeah, that would be me. If we can acknowledge our fear, we can realize that right now, right now, we are okay. Right now, today, we are still alive and our bodies are working marvelously. Marvelously, sort of. <laughs> All this to say that fear is very common. If we have no fears, it makes me wonder if we're alive. In fact, one of those Bible things that I saw was, the Bible mentions fear not in some phrasing or another 365 times. And the person writing that said, that's one for every day of the year. <laughs> so there you go. In this morning's two lessons, the disciples were struggling with their fears. In the first lesson from Mark, they're crossing the Sea of Galilee right after Jesus had fed the 5,000, minus Jesus in this story who'd stayed behind to pray. And that's what one commenter called that storm that they was, called it a nor'easter. Well, we know about nor'easters. They can be pretty scary. And the rowing is hard and it's dark. It must have been, a, you know, nor'easters have starless, moonless nights, right? In this storm, Jesus is not asleep in the boat, and he's nowhere to be seen. The disciples are simply following his instructions, go across the sea. And even though some of them were fishermen and maybe used to these conditions, we know they weren't all fishermen, and I'm sure some, maybe even the fishermen with this nor'easter, were scared. But what really scares them is this person, this stranger, walking on water to them. Was it a ghost? Who or what was it? The answer comes in their befuddlement when Jesus says to his disciples, it is I, do not be afraid. Well, it's hard to say, does that mean, don't be afraid of the storm, I'm here to help? or don't be afraid of the stranger walking on water. There's a whole lot that could be delved into in this story, but for me, there is one important point when it comes to tackling our fears. First though, it is, I want to say what is certain that living with fear and being on guard can make our startle reflex greater. The point I wanna make is Jesus comes in surprising ways ways we are not always expecting, ways in which it may be hard to recognize Jesus, but he comes. And we might not need to be afraid of the stranger who comes to us walking on water. One writer said, if you expect to see Jesus, if you expect Jesus to walk on the rough waters around you, you will see him in the people holding out their hands, offering you the miracle of kindness and concern. And in that other story, that post-Easter story that we heard again in July, it's all about fear. 
In that story, the disciples had been through the worst experience of their lives. They had gone from the, jo from the joy of Palm Sunday morning, uh, Sunday morning, Sabbath morning, that triumphant entry to Jerusalem, to the depth of despair in one week's time. Jesus, whom they had followed, who had, they'd learned from, who they loved dearly, had been murdered on a cross. That's a major, major fear. And after learning from Mary, who had been sent by Jesus to them, Mary found them in the locked room, told them that Jesus had risen. Fear, it seems, still kept them from running back to that tomb to see if they might see what Mary had seen. Kept them from running to see if they could encounter Jesus. Fear had stopped them in their tracks, as that early advice giver said. Fear can immobilize us. We just don't know what to do. And the other thing is, fear is catching. In a room full of fear, if you don't have it, you'll probably catch it. The Gospel writer says it was fear of Jews that was keeping them in the room, but I guess they also had some other fears. Fear, very practical fears. Fear of the Romans. Fear of what happens to us now. Who are we without our fearless leader? It was a fear-filled room with locked doors. But there is good news to tell in this story. God comes to fear-filled rooms just as God and Jesus came across that stormy sea. And again, that day, it was in a surprising way. The God who refuses, who cannot leave us again, comes in the person of the risen Christ in the evening as darkness, like on that dark night and the storm on the sea. God comes to us. Darkness, with all its implications. Darkness, darkness times. Many of us resonate with dark times. But darkness, and remember this, darkness does not keep God out. Locked doors do not keep Christ out. Fear and uncertainty and doubt cannot keep Christ out. Jesus comes, wounds and all, to say, peace be with you. Before this Jesus of surprises leaves those people, those disciples, he gifts them with three things. First, he reminds them again that he offers them peace. Peace he leaves with them, like a gift placed on a table, like a gift placed in their hearts. The second thing he does is to commission them. Do they have to wonder anymore what they are to do? Do they have to remain immobilized, uncertain of what comes next? No. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. If I'd been there, I would have said, oh my God, look what happened to Jesus. Fear again? Maybe. I don't think they'd lose all their fear of the Jewish leaders and the Romans just like that. We rarely lose our fears all at once just like that. Living unafraid, seems to me, takes practice like so much. And then Jesus does a third crucial thing. Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them, just as God the Creator breathed life into the first humans. Jesus breathed the power of the Holy Spirit onto them. And with that breath, I can imagine courage beginning to fill those people. Confidence increased. Maybe there was still some hesitancy, because in a week's time, what did we find out? They're back in that same locked room again this time with Thomas, present. And what happens? Jesus comes again into that fear room through locked doors. So maybe, I'm concluding, maybe learning to fear, 
To deal with fear is a process. Maybe it takes time, and maybe it takes practice, sometimes a lot of practice. So we need to be patient with ourselves as we learn how to deal with fear. So, did these gifts work? Do they still work? And if so, how? How are, the, are there answers to these in questions? Well, I think we wouldn't be here worshiping this morning if the disciples hadn't remained mobilized by their fear. For them, once the reality of the living Jesus' presence was clear, their fears gave way to encourage, incredible courage and perseverance. They undoubtedly encountered fear again because we all do, but I imagine they would recall over and over again that post-Easter moment and realize again and again that they live and work and have their being in the presence of the living God and the living Christ. They are not alone, just as their ancestors in the faith were never alone. To walk the road of life, the disciples in ministry with one another had to have felt that God was walking that road with them. It was true back then, it is true today. This presence is something that gives us courage, gives us strength, and increases our confidence and our hope. The late United Methodist Bishop Reuben Job wisely writes, this does not mean that we will be spared discouragement, disease, or death itself. It does mean that we will never be alone. Therefore, I believe that we will be given the strength to meet the storms of our lives living them in the moment, one day at a time. We only have to do it one day at a time. Remembering these stories is part of the work of, that can help us do it. Another answer is community. The 11 disciples were there together for that second encounter in Jesus, and we know there were other disciples, like Mary Magdalene, like Cleopas and his partner, like Mary and Martha of Bethany, like so many others that didn't abandon the ship when Jesus was murdered and who trusted the stories about his resurrection. Together, these men and women formed the beginning of what would be the church, the beginning of the Christian community. When we are in community, we support one another. We encourage, we listen, we offer advice, we give hugs when we can. We pray for each other, for our concerns, and bit by bit, feelings of peace start to form in our minds. Prayer is part of the answer. That's what Jesus was doing when he was away before he came out to them on the, on the water. Prayer is the perfect place to name our fears, and we don't have to wait for October 12th. Whether in prayer by ourselves or with a good friend, naming our fear deprives that fear of so much power. The worst thing that we can imagine practically never happens, if you think about it. We do well to seek help by sharing our fears, even the secret ones, with a trusted someone. Shared fears are less scary. We might need to ask someone for help when it's embarrassing to go places that seem unknown, to take, small, take on small, manageable risks. And that story from the locked room offers one more answer. I alluded to it before. Jesus gave the disciples a mission. Mission is part of the answer. He gave them a purpose. He sent them. In John, as we heard, it is to forgive. In Matthew, it is to make disciples. In Luke, it is to be witnesses. So fear something? Get involved in something. Get out of the locked room or that boat and wrap yourself up in something for someone else or some cause. You have a fair coming up. I bet Nina might still be able to use some help. Bake, sell, 
donate, circulate around the people who will be milling around and be that friendly face that says hi and meets it, meets their eyes. And you've got a great justice committee. Just ask Rod, just ask me, just ask some others. Find out how Rod and how the committee, how you can be helpful. You might even want to join. Be a witness to the love of God in a way that you reveal your love for others. And then remember one last thing. That breath of the Spirit breathed on the disciples. That breath is still breathing on us. The power of the Holy Spirit goes with us. Now this is really the very last thing I want to share with you. It's an affirmation of faith from the United Church of Canada. This UCC is the largest denomination in Canada. It was inaugurated in 1925 when the Methodists, the Congregationalists, and 70% of the Presbyterians entered into union. We do have problems, don't we? Since then, it has added a few more denominations. The creed was adopted in 1968. Now, I looked in my chalice hymnal at home. I looked in the wrong place to find affirmations of faith. But it is in your hymnal. It's number 360 in the middle of the hymnal. In my hymnal, they're all at the end. If you want to look at it, 360, and listen as I read it. I love this. I always use this at, an, at a funeral or memorial service. We are not alone, 360. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Friends, when the storms of life are raging, you are not alone. Amen.